Ladies and gentlemen, our program will now begin. Please welcome the CEO of the Churchill Club, Karen Tucker. Thank you very much. Welcome. Really appreciate all of you spending your evening with us tonight. Our conversation is called The Promise of the Connected Car, What It Can Be and Who Can Win. We're privileged to have with us four distinguished speakers, starting with Rob Changor of NVIDIA, Johan Youngworth of Mercedes-Benz R&D North America, Jim Meisner of Transportation Technology Ventures, also a consultant, and Martin Searhaus of Nissan Research Center, Silicon Valley, and of course, our moderator, Jamie Butters of Bloomberg News. Thank you all, and we really appreciate you being here as well. And we would also like to thank our sponsors, Bloomberg News and NVIDIA, for making this event possible. A couple of people that I'd like to call out for their exceptional help in putting this program together. And the first is Jamie Butters. Thank you, Jamie. We could not have done this without you. And the second is Tracy Perry of Airfoil Group. Really appreciate your help. Here's Tracy. Here's Tracy. Need to meet her. A word about Churchill Club, an independent nonprofit technology and business forum founded in 1985, just about the time that Windows 1.0 was hitting the scene. <laughs> Our mission is to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. And we do this through the up to 40 programs that we present each year where like minds, such as you in the room tonight, can connect with one another and with fresh ideas. And we do respectfully ask our speakers not to pitch, to leave their corporate messaging at the door, and instead to think of themselves as independent thought leaders with all of the knowledge that they come with from their professional affiliations to contribute to the common good. We are especially excited about the diverse perspectives and views that our speakers are going to share with us tonight. Please consider joining us on August 21 for Mobile Moments, the new battleground for customers. And on September 25th, it's the Churchills, an amazing and inspiring program that highlights excellence in four key areas, innovation, social good, leadership, and collaboration. <laughs> And uh, we definitely encourage you to come to that. Uh, the three awards that we can announce so far, the global benefactor is Malala Yousafzai. The legendary leader is Paul Jacobs of Qualcomm. And the game changer is Airbnb. And we have one more to announce, but that'll happen soon. If you'd like to consider joining us or supporting in some way that would be meaningful to you, please know that we would appreciate that very much. Learn more about us at churchillclub.org. If you're tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club, and you'll find other Twitter codes in the program on your tables. And then finally, I want to point out that we have an incredible audience here tonight with many leaders from the connected car ecosystem. So we hope that you will ask for the microphone and contribute to the conversation during Q&A. Our moderator, Jamie Butters, first fell in love with cars when he was seven years old, and he attended the Indy 500. Now he's based in Detroit, and he's covered the auto industry for over 15 years. For the past six of those, he has been with Bloomberg News, and he leads the team for US transportation there. We certainly appreciate the great lengths that he took to be with us tonight. Please give your warmest welcome to our moderator, Jamie Butters. Thank you. Thanks. Glad to be here. Really fun to come back to the, this area, down in the, truly in the heart of Silicon Valley. Uh, so we're talking about connected cars. Let's first have some definition talk. Uh, Martin, can you start us off? What should, how should we, at least for the next hour and a half, we can change it after this, but for the next hour and a half, how should we define connectivity? What is, what is it? What is the point? Wow, why you pick on me? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So for me, connectivity um, is, is many different things. Um, it's, it's obviously when we talk about connectivity, we all think about the internet. You know, so that's you know, far and foremost you know, one of the, of course, ways to communicate from the car out to uh, the rest of the world. Um, but for me, it's also connectivity within the car um, and, you know, being at a research center, you know, we have to think more broadly than just thinking about, you know, Pandora or Facebook in the car. You know, that to me is not, not so interesting uh, uh, from a research point of view. What is interesting is to understand what a network in the car is about, just like a network in your home. Um, what um, uh, connectivity between other cars is about, what connectivity between your car and the infrastructure is about. Um, you know, and, and the way I, you know, I don't come from the car industry. I come from, uh, you know, space exploration. I spent more than a decade thinking about how it would mean to live and work on Mars. So for me, the car is like a spacesuit. When I worked with uh, astronauts at NASA, they said, you know, my spacesuit is three things. It's my work environment, it's my life support system, and it's my home. Don't with it. <laughs> right? um, so, so that's how I look at, at, at uh, the car as well. I mean, I, I, and, and I need to be connected in order to be uh, doing what I need to do in the car. So Jim, what, what can we expect as consumers to, to benefit from this connectivity? What, what is it going to mean to the 100 million people around the world buying a car in well, 10 years? Certainly the, the prospect of personal mobility as manifested in the car or your transportation mode would be one because then it's accessibility to the world. Um, but from a social good perspective, and oftentimes as consumers we don't think that, but in mass we should, there's the benefits to sustainability, to mobility, and to safety that connectivity can afford you in different forms. How do, how does we, how do we get a sustainability benefit from connectivity? Well, it's, it's, there are very con automated vehicle centric ways of thinking about it which is car to car go you like the Indy 500 mm -hmm. uh, you can draft with with connectivity if it's mm -hmm. done in a high reliable high quality of service low latency way which is a very extreme idea of connectivity mm -hmm. but on a more more uh, uh, near to earth short term example think about navigation aids mm -hmm. in fact i got here and by avoiding traffic jams and driving smoother by have being connected to traffic. So uh, it, it spans the gamut. Yeah, I, I wish my uh, navigation had helped me avoid the traffic. I, I should have found a different route. Well, you, you uh, bought, well, you know, I have a smartphone. It's <laughs> part of that connectivity yeah. equation. You're right. So, uh, so, JJ, what about innovators? Well, I'm sure we have several here in the room. What should, what should they be bringing to the table? What can they hope for from this mobile playground? Yes. Actually, I think it's a lot and there are many, many different aspects where innovation will happen uh, in, uh, in this connected car uh, connectivity space. And I think in the last 10 years, you know, we focused on kind of bringing the internet into the car and, uh, um, you know, connecting the car with smartphones and so on. But now the next step is really to bring the car into the internet. And what does that mean? If the car now becomes a node, you know, in this internet of things, <laughs> in the internet of everything, now think of this space, you know, of, of the car really becoming intelligent, being able to potentially even make decisions, being connected to your home, to yourself, being really a node, you know, in, in this connected life. Uh, in my opinion, there is so much room for innovation, uh, not just within the vehicle, but actually within the space around it. If you think about all these, like, you know, layers of digital information uh, around us, uh, which we can make visible in the car, you know, by using windshields and windows as <laughs> augmented reality displays and, and a lot more. Yep. All right, so Rob, you in, your company invents reality all the time for people playing video games. What about in their, in their car? How, how does that play out there? What's um, well, I think the, uh, when we look at video games, we, we look at it as uh, uh, one of the most demanding computing audiences in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to reproduce reality in a video game is, takes a staggering amount of technology. Um, that's why uh, the GPUs we make are, are actually the largest pieces of silicon on the planet. Um, it turns out that there are uh, similar 
computing problems that can use that architecture. And within the, uh, within the automobile, it's not just graphics, mm -hmm. but it's compute applications. So um, computer vision is essentially, you know, think of it as the reverse of graphics. You know, instead of painting <laughs> pixels, you're sucking in you know, from the outside world and then processing the imagery. So um, when I think of the connected car, it's an umbrella term. You know, it, mm -hmm. it kind of encompasses a lot of different things. But um, you know, one of the major challenges, we think, for this connected car Whenever people talk about it and they mention casually, you know, that this car will do this, it'll recognize pedestrians, it'll do machine learning, uh, it'll do all these things. Uh, in our mind, we're just going, this is now a supercomputer. I mean, this is a computer the size of a basketball court that somehow has to fit into this <laughs> car, and, and how are we going to do that? So uh, I think there's a lot of promise, because you can take a lot of this technology, put it in a data center. Right? Imagine having machine learning in a data center and it's connected to the car. The car is doing some of the processing, the data center is doing the other processing. And you, what you have is an extremely powerful supercomputer uh, at work and it's working you know, in a connected way with the vehicle. All right. So, so many of us, when we think about connected cars, we think about uh, autonomous driving and autonomous cars. And, not long ago, Churchill Club had a great conversation that spent a lot of time on autonomous cars, and we don't want to get sucked into that too much. But there is a relationship. Uh, so, Martin, can you help spell out for us? I mean, how are they different, and how are they similar? What's the, the interplay, or the, or the non-interplay, between connectivity and, and autonomy? Well, you know, I think if you think about autonomous technology for driving, we don't need necessarily connectivity in order to build autonomous vehicles. Um, as a matter of fact, we better make sure that we can drive autonomously when we don't have connectivity. Otherwise, you know, there are many places where you probably won't be able to drive. Um, now, so that, that being said, I mean, there, there is, of course, networking that we need in the car in order to build an autonomous vehicle. So when you talk about connectivity, you know, um, I, I need to have connectivity in the car itself. And, and you, can, you can think about that as a network and a an, um, c connection to the rest of the car. But leaving that alone, I, I think connectivity to the cloud, uh, to other cars, will, will, make the, will sometimes make the problem easier. Um, but would also provide, in the long run, services, and this is what I think uh, you know, connected car is about, is a, uh, understanding and thinking about what are the services that we can provide when you no longer have to be just occupied with driving the vehicle. And that, I think, is a space where um, you know, we can explore. And, and you, know, uh, y you can make the connection between the connected car and a, and a mobile phone. But, but I, I think that connection, that, that similarity soon breaks when you think about the car being a phone that you're inside of. You know, um, you know that is a profoundly different kind of device. Um, and it speaks to my analogy, I think, with a spacesuit and, a, and, a, and an astronaut. Um, and I think if you now think about uh, safety, if you think about entertainment, um, we can go into many different uh, you know, discussions and areas to explore. Mm -hmm. And that's exciting. Mm -hmm. you know, that's just wonderful. So, JJ, is that how they uh, see it at Mercedes as well? Or is, uh, is there any difference in approach there? I think there are some difference in the sen differences in the sense, uh, especially focusing around, you know, uh, connectivity and autonomous driving kind of belonging together and actually uh, even using like the cloud using real-time information about uh, not just traffic but maybe construction zones maybe uh, you know uh, really basically and uh, you would call it maybe an HD map or high-definition map uh, you know which has much more information than the maps of today and a even self-learning map which learns over time <laughs> continuously and you know, where you get kind of a release or, or uh, a, uh, an okay, let's say, for the route to go from A to B. And, and, you know, maybe each morning when you take your, or you have your autonomous drive uh, or autonomous car actually drive you to work, it might take different routes and so on based on a lot of different information. And all of that information uh, likely 
you know, comes from the cloud. Of course, you know, the, all the decision making, the situation analysis and, and uh, all of that, you know, all of these algorithms have to be on board and it has all to work without connectivity. Mm -hmm. But I think there will be a lot of technology and a lot of, let's say, hybrid solutions uh, with, uh, you know, the connectivity in, in the car and the networking and all of that. But, you know, with a lot of, let's say, intelligence uh, in the cloud, uh, which will be used uh, for autonomous driving. Mm -hmm. So, so if we had autonomous cars, we could have a lot more connectivity. We could have almost infinite, con or we, have, we could have an awful lot of connectivity. But in the meantime, it seems like we're expecting, uh, you know, a lot of the people I talk to in the industry are saying, you know, they expect the cars to talk to each other so you can know if the car in front of you and the car in front of you and the car in front of that is braking urgently because a, a deer or a ball or a child has run into the street. and uh, and and the, how do, Jim? How how's the vehicle to vehicle communication get us there or well, replace that? Or well, there's a name for that because everyone makes an out phrase for things that they like. That's a good idea. So EEBL, electronic emergency electronic brake light. So you just described the concept very well. And the connectivity there is a safety proposition. Mm -hmm. So it is different. It could be orthogonal. Or it could be leading into autonomous driving. And that proposition is based on ubiquity of short-range communication. So that means it's based on a government mandate. And I'm in the Silicon Valley, we talk government mandates, they don't really, they kind of collide, if you excuse the <laughs> analogy. Uh, but in fact, um, if indeed this rulemaking occurs, which is dedicated short-range communication, those of you who read the program see that I'm chair of a dedicated short-range communication <coughs> technical committee in standards. So for me, it's a real world. For you, maybe standards is not so real. But the point is, is that um, that connectivity, which is being standardized at a bunch of levels, may be mandated. If so, then that vision that you speak of and other visions that could or may not lead to autonomy will happen. So, okay, my, my understanding is you know, there was supposed to be a report like in March, and then maybe in July, and then maybe last week, maybe in a few weeks. Uh, this, you know, a step toward this, you know, rulemaking that, that the Obama administration wants to, mm -hmm. to establish so we can all use the same language and the same wavelength and, and, and get these kind of breakthroughs in pretty near term, right? Is, is that going to happen? Are they, is, they, is there enough time to make that rule happen before we have a new president and a new administration that wants to start all over again and put their own stamp on it? I'm an engineer. <laughs> um, so, I mean, uh, certainly the antecedent work that goes into that report has been done. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of car makers, some of whom actually are part of it. Mercedes is part of this called CAMP, Crash of, another proper noun, Crash Avoidance Metrics Partnership, which is uh, working very assiduously with federal dollars and cost share dollars to make it happen. Um, the technical issues are uh, channel congestion, security, whether or not there are minimum performance requirements. All that is happening. It's going to be worked on. Whether it's going to happen before or after the Obama administration uh, ends, and if it does end, then will it even happen? These are questions of conjecture, and we're in the Silicon Valley. We're not in DC. I wish I could <laughs> okay. answer that. Well, it seems like maybe we can just solve it with, you know, if, if we all just to agree to move forward without ever having a rule. Could happen. It could so, happen in Europe. <laughs> that, that would be nice. So in, in Detroit, I'm sure it happens throughout the industry everywhere, but I think Detroit and the, the U.S. auto industry has a particularly kind of bad history of relationships between the automakers and their business partners, their suppliers, their dealers, sometimes even the customers. Um, so, Rob, what's been your experience and where do you think we can, can go? Are there, is there room to improve is in this brave new world of, com of supercomputers on wheels? Are, can, are there breakthroughs that can be made that change the dynamic of how companies deal with each other? Uh, well, certainly. Uh, and the, the reason I would say that is just it, it's already happening. So how so? Well, you're, you're seeing, I think, um, I mean, you're, you're seeing car, uh, car companies um, make a couple fundamental acknowledgments. First of all, uh, the, the car has now become the single most sophisticated computer that a consumer will own. And if you're comparing, 
Um, I think we're very close. Okay. And I mean, just you know, as a frame of reference, uh, I think we had you know uh, a current generation processor from NVIDIA is about 384 gigaflops, and if you have a two-car garage and each car has four of them, that's that's three trillion, or three teraflops. Okay. Which is um, basically the the computing power of uh, the Blue Mountain supercomputer in the United States in, in 1998, right? <laughs> so it's gone from that to, you know, to a couple chips. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I think car makers have, have recognized that a consumer, if they're going to have content in their car, why is this content eight years old, whereas the content that's on my phone is, is current? So there's lessons that you don't have to reinvent the architecture of a computer. There's lots of lessons that have already been learned in the computer industry, like you know, like gamers replace the graphics in their PC not by swapping out the whole PC, but by adding a graphics card. So mm -hmm. having a modular card so that you can upgrade, right, and change the design pretty quickly. So I think there's lessons like that 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 are, that come from the computer industry that the car makers are starting to acknowledge and starting to. So all we need to do is re-architecture the auto industry. <laughs> or the auto, perhaps. Well, yeah, I didn't say it's all happening at once. You know, I think, uh, but I think as, you know, as, as car makers start to look at all of the, the shopping list of all the things they want to do and you know, all those things, I think you, know, it's, you, you, have to, you have to start thinking more like a, a computer company. Yeah. So, JJ, you've been doing this for a while, for really as long as I've even been around cars. Uh, is it different? Is the relationship between car makers and technology companies that solve problems for them in a different way than a seat company or a, or a plastics maker that does a, a console. Is that relationship different and how's that evolved in, in your time? It's very different actually in my opinion and uh, even looking at partnerships like for example with Nvidia it's really eye to eye level partnerships and relationships uh, with other players like Google, like Apple uh, like others in the valley, you know, from Facebook uh, through Twitter uh, and, and, you know, all the content providers. Uh, we are really thinking and we are working actually with these uh, companies as partners. And um, I think it's very different than the traditional, you know, tier one, tier two, tier three type of approach. And actually we are now in a situation where, you know, if you look at our 70 to 100, you know, ECUs in an S-Class of today <laughs> uh, with, uh, you know, uh, NVIDIA GPUs and, and other CPUs and so on. It's like all of these modules, like 70 plus computers uh, in, in a car. And, uh, you know, we are now involved in basically working directly with like tier two, tier three partners and so on, because it's very important. It's important for our developers, basically, you know, to have a continuation when you think about the user experience design. And if you look at an S-Class of today, for example, uh, with these two 12.3 inch displays and the head-up display, I mean, this digital real estate, you know, is becoming larger and larger. And, and a lot actually will change, in my opinion, uh, around the connected car and the whole experience, actually, by focusing on this digital user experience in the future, even more so because it's different. You know, we are not just uh, replacing, basically, the old analog instruments with digital displays and then you ba basically just draw the same kind of analog instruments. We, you, we really basically are, are working on a completely new you know, generation of, of, of uh, you know, advanced technologies and, and driving the experience to you know, use machine learning, use you know, predictive user experience where the car can like, become a, a, a good friend, a good old friend or um, you know, a digital companion where when you go into the car, the car already knows knows where you want to drive, it knows what music you want to listen to, it knows your ambient light setting, it knows your climate control settings, your seat heating, seat cooling, armrest seating, uh, everything, you know, basically uh, is part of your profile, it's part of that experience and, and I think over time basically you will see uh, that, you know, through these partnerships, uh, you know, we will have, um, you know, an Apple experience through Apple CarPlay in a Mercedes or, you know, other cars. Uh, We'll have an Android Auto, Android experience uh, in the different brands of automobiles. And um, I think it, it is basically completely changing on how we, we view these partnerships and how we work with, with the different partners. So, Martin, as somebody who's, who's newer, who comes from a different industry, I mean, where are, 
and I realize you're more advanced research than you know these uh, <clears throat> short-term pedestrian problems, <laughs> but uh, but where are the? Do you see you know areas of, of conflict or opportunities for for change and progress? Conflict. Um, I don't see conflict in, in opportunities to change. I actually, you know, like JJ says, I think. I mean, you know, I feel. If it's any time to come into the car industry, it's now. I mean, this is like the next, you know, what the world is your oyster if, if you start having computer power. Um, so for me, it's, it's really about the opportunity. Uh, thinking out of the box of what a car is about. And I think, so autonomy is one area where we start thinking about transportation in a completely different way. Um, the connected car, um, it, you know, will enhance that even further. And, I, you know, the way that I look at the car might be a little different than the traditional auto, you know, automotive person thinks about the car. I mean, I, I think about the car as a human being having an activity that I'm pursuing, and I want the car to be just like a, a room in my home. It just happens to be, or in my office, it happens to be on wheels, and it moves, but I want it to be seamless. I want it to be functional for what I want to do. And I think these, the connectivity and autonomy will create this environment that will allow us as a, as a society to think about you know, transportation and cars in a completely different way. That to me is, uh, is as exciting as thinking about how to live and work on Mars, because it is actually, we can do this in the next 10 years here on Earth. And it's, you know, I found out it's going to take another 50 years to go to Mars. So, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> so to me, you know, this, this, is, this, this is where I think innovation will be the next, uh, the next decade will be the car. And, you know, and that's why NVIDIA is here. Uh, that's why, you know, uh, the radios with connectivity that Jim has been researching for the last 10 years. I was just saying to Jim before, it's like, if you stay in an industry long enough, it will become interesting. <laughs> you know, I, I think you know it is now. You know, it's it's really uh, so. That's so, so. There is no conflict. There okay. is only opportunity. Great. Well, I, I I wish my house was as nice as as the car you're inventing, but uh, it will be. <laughs> well, so Jim, when do we need to think beyond the car and and uh, into the the infrastructure, whether it's uh, smart roads, smart stoplights. Uh, other other things in in the world that need to, to help well, us. I want to answer Martin's question. Oh, please. So <laughs> I, I I did my first connected car experiment in 1997, uh, using office land. So yeah, I've been around, and, and I wish it would happen sooner. But back to the infrastructure, and that has been. When should we think about it? We should have thought about it 30 years ago, because if you go to an old city and you stand underneath the traffic signal, you hear a click, click, click. What is that? as an electromechanical controller, which is as old as I am. So the point is, is that cycles of innovation, in the program we talked about short-term cycles of innovation with some company like NVIDIA. And it's slightly longer, but still, compared to the infrastructure, speed of light cycle, actually, literally and figuratively, cycles of innovation from others. The infrastructure doesn't move that quickly. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So, we have to convince the infrastructure that the connected car is part of its own ecosystem. And it will be, because with enough market penetration, enough ubiquity, people who own and manage the infrastructure will see cost savings and safety of life back to these old, excuse the, the, the term pedestrian, but it really figuratively literally is these pedestrian issues, which deal with safety, mobility, and the environment. So the point is, is that there's already work being done, albeit at a slower, less exciting pace than this. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs to be quickened. It's not going to happen unless we, uh, we have a connected car and basically kick the rest of the people in the pants. So if we get the car, then we, or we get some connectivity, in the, more connectivity in the car, then we can get more in the infrastructure yeah. and then they work together. Yeah, there are a lot of models, but let me give you one, and I don't want to seem like, a, like I have only one horse, but mm -hmm. let's take this DSRC model. Let's pretend that Washington acts before the end of the Obama administration. Okay. And then that means, like, say, 2019, every car will have to have this radio, this DSRC transceiver. Oh, in about two years, 10% of all cars, hey, that's a great probe. The infrastructure owner-operator will want to have a roadside access point. 
um, because it will make things more efficient. Then you can have demand responsive traffic signals. You can do all sorts of traffic controls. So it takes a chicken and an egg, perhaps, but I think that what we have, and I don't want to be pejorative to chickens or eggs, but we have, we've started <laughs> something with a connected car. Will it probably be, if we get the DSRC, will it probably be like stoplights? It could be, and you know, the, the thing about stoplights, and so with, let's talk about, let's, let's, let's quit embracing DSRC, talk about all media. Right. So wireless media, so you don't have to do things locally, you can do things centrally. You could do things in a, in a city's traffic control center where you have connectivity to that. Therefore, um, it doesn't have to be DSRC, but the point is that the connected car connected to what, the cloud, locally, whatever, uh, that will start to spur the rest of us to, to try to catch up to the cycle of innovation that I just spoke about. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> I hate to admit this in front of this kind of an audience, but I just recently joined Twitter. I, I put it off because every time, I know, it's been <laughs> tough. Uh, every time I was about to do it, because it's necessary in my business, right? But every time I was gonna do it, somebody would get hacked, right? And then it's like they're sending out headlines they don't mean to, they're sending out press releases that aren't supposed to go out yet, or you know, and I'm very anxious about <clears throat> sending out bad information under my name. So I kept putting it off and I said, finally I had to do it. Uh, but how do we ensure that that first generation, second generation of connected cars isn't as vulnerable as you know every idiot walking around with a Twitter account? Uh, JJ, any thoughts on how, what, what we do about that? Yeah, I mean, we, we introduced the first connected car in 1999, and so we have some you know, years of experience now uh, having a connectivity module, uh, you know, even in the analog times, you know, back in uh, 1999. Um, now, of course, 3G and uh, going to 4G, LTE, uh, and so on. So um, I think it's very important that you firewall, basically, um, all of this, let's say, playground around infotainment, navitainment, entertainment, uh, uh, you name it, you know, even augmented reality and, and uh, uh, you know, predictive user experience and so on from you know, the real safety, critical, safety relevant, um, you know, let's say action and modules and, and actuator sensors and so on. So that's, that's the most important. So that even, you know, when someone can, you know, break into the car, can reach the car, somehow hack into, that they cannot do anything wrong. Yeah, so, uh, you know, let's assume uh, worst case is that maybe your music stops playing, you know, your internet radio or so. Uh, so I think it's important that we pay a lot of attention you know, to security, to data privacy, and I think we have learned, uh, you know, over uh, basically the last uh, uh, 14 years, uh, 15 years, that this can be done and can be achieved. And we have actually our own um, teams, actually, of, of hackers, of white hackers, as we call them, which basically take every new generation of vehicles, of systems, and so on, and try to break into it and, and try to, you know, see where there are uh, basically uh, points which we need to improve before we ship mm -hmm. and uh, we take that very seriously. So uh, somebody's not going to be able to swoop in on all the cars in America and make one third of them go 100 miles an hour, one third of them go backwards and one third of them stop? Not Mercedes, no. <laughs> not Mercedes. <laughs> Only Mercedes. Well is it going to be a, uh, Jim do we need a, a, a an industry standard, is there, is there going to have to be there a special one. cop to, well, a special well, national cop to keep our roads safe that well, way? There's a difference between standards and enforcement. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, in fact, there are Etsy or European standards, mm -hmm. and there is in fact an IEEE standard. Um, if you want to talk to me afterwards and you want to be really excited, go to IEEE 1609 meetings with me. Um, <laughs> but. The, the real institutional framework to build this in terms of a safety critical connectivity, which is slightly different than, than a telematics or IVI type of connectivity, then you would think, well, you need a PKI system or something like that. You need a uh, system of trust and a certificate authority, then the government gets involved, it becomes a big question mark. So certainly we know technically how to do cryptography. We know how to pass certificates, but how would we do it institutionally? Big question. Uh, Rob and well, actually, from the I, have, I have a question for these guys. <laughs> um, 
you know, I had talked earlier just about the, you know, lessons learned from the industry. I mean, it, last week I was at a, another conference and I sat with the, uh, the NHTSA mm -hmm. uh, guy and I asked him, what, you know, why is all of this being treated as something completely new? You know, why aren't there, you know, why isn't this, you know, built on, you know, things we've already learned in the cellular industry? You know, we, we all have learned a long time ago to trust uh, banking online and financial things. And yes, you're not driving a car and running over people, but you're, you know, you're, you, you have the ability, you know, there's the potential for lots of financial damage and everything if you don't have secure systems and firewalls and, and all of those things. So I guess the question, you know, maybe I, you know, I would ask Jim is, you know, you know why, why are, what are the new things that, that are being brought up? Why isn't it just, you know, uh, building on a lot of the, the things that we've already well, established. it's extremely nuanced, and I said I was an engineer, so nuance really yeah. isn't, really, I can barely spell it. Um, <laughs> but, but, but in essence, if you have a, a mandated system, that means that issues of trackability, if the government knows who you are, and issues of privacy will become social issues. So, you know, if, if you opt into something, then there are all sorts of social ways that you can acceptably provide this type of security. If you don't opt into something, it becomes much more difficult. Now, isn't this something we do now? I mean, you know, you do that on your phone, you do it when you're... Yeah, but, you know, I, I don't have to. Actually, I guess I do. It's a social imperative. I don't have to own a smartphone. <laughs> um, but if someone says you must have this in your car, it becomes a, a bigger issue. That, that, um, and I don't want to, to regale the audience, sorry, bore the audience with all the issues, but post facto we can talk about, about them, but they're manifold and it's one of the more complicating factors to having a, a rulemaking. Yeah. Okay. I think just um, the yeah, only thing no. I would just add, you know, uh, from our perspective, uh, you know, it, there's obviously, it's an application dependent thing, right? If a video game fails or if a, you know, if your nav system fails or, you know, your song stops playing, that's not a, a mission critical thing. But, but there are lots of applications within the computing world where you have mission critical types of applications and then there's, there's a number of technologies that come to bear mm -hmm. on that. So whether it's ECC or virtualization or all sorts of things that you, you, you work on to deliver that. So I kind of see that uh, a lot of the security issues, you know, again, and I'm, I'm kind of going back to the, you know, the theme. I think everything, I agree, right? There's a difference between engineering a solution and, and whatever happens on the regulation side. But, but um, I believe that the, you know, again, it, breaking it down to a, you know, maybe it's too much from a Silicon Valley perspective, but breaking it down into a computer problem, these are things that we've worked on before. Yeah. So, so, so I would challenge one computer problem that um, I don't know anybody who has solved this, and I, I actually know of no research uh, being done on this, and that is about autonomy and security. You know, um, th this is a, a, a field that, um, you know, uh, yes, people, people have done uh, uh, encryption and cryptography and, you know, um, solved the post office problems and the banking problems. Um, we still have breakings, right? Target, so it's still, right? right? Um, <laughs> but nobody has developed a autonomous system that when it's broken into, will always act correctly and can detect that it's broken into and then act according to you know, what you're trying to do. And this to me is a research area that, um, you know, I mean, I think this is fascinating. You know, to me, this is like, uh, wow, you know, give me a problem that nobody has to solve, <laughs> but this is something that I think is, is a fabulous research problem to have. And I don't think the computer industry has solved this problem. Um, not in the military, uh, not at NASA, uh, not in industry and not at the academia. Um, and I think this is, uh, you know, what a great thing the autonomous car will bring to the world is that we will do research in this. <laughs> yeah, Martin, if, if, if all the problems were solved, then I'd be out of a job. So. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, so, so that I think is a fascinating uh, um, uh, problem. All right, so the, that's the challenge for you guys, uh, solve that problem be a great future for you. Uh, so before you get to your questions, uh, we're going to do a, a quick uh, lightning round. Uh, quick question for each of you. Um, OK, so what is your, your biggest hope, your, the thing that's most exciting to you that you hope will, will come about in connected cars in the next 10 years? Rob, start with you. Wow. Um, 
I guess in the next 10 years, um, I imagine and what I hope is that uh, we will see a, 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 com a combination of a bunch of technologies that up until now have been kind of separate. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've had speech recognition, but, mm -hmm. you know, we've had uh, human machine interface, we've had uh, high resolution displays. But I think, uh, I, uh, touching on something JJ mentioned earlier, you know, the, the, the opportunity for all of these different applications to come together in a, in a, in a, in a, in a rolling, you know, in a computer that, that uh, informs you, makes driving more safe, uh, and delights you, you know, is, uh, is I think something that's transformational. You know, it, it, it's not just about, you know, the experience, of, but, but I think we have, we're talking about real social problems, lost productivity in the nation, you know, uh, the kind of things that, you know, effective computer vision in a car can solve uh, are very real and could change our lives and, and improve, a, a, improve, I think, a society overall. Great. Okay, you were first, so you get a little bit of slack, but lightning round, quick answers. JJ? <laughs> so for me, the car, for me, the car is actually the ultimate mobile device. And uh, with that, thinking about the next 10 years, I mean, having autonomous driving as a given and then thinking beyond autonomous driving. Now think about you are in this car, it drives you from A to B, and uh, it can become whatever you want it to be. You know, your lounge, your living room, your movie theater, your, um, you know, musical hall uh, with a, an awesome sound system, which you don't even have in, you know, your living room at home. And, uh, and I think, you know, combine that with the digital experience, you know, with augmented reality and, and uh, you know, with basically having the car be whatever you want it to be in that moment in time and maybe even in a one hour commute to have, you know, slices of 20 minutes, uh, you know, lounge mode and 20 minutes, maybe your office space and even a video conference with your office and, and so on with, with people at work and then another 20 minutes off you know, basically the musical hall or, or, or music theater. That would be awesome. All right. Jim? The World Health Organization says there are one million road fatalities a year. I would like to see the connected car make a big dent. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse the pun. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, one, I'm sorry, one million road fatalities. work related fatalities? Road. Road fatalities. That's right. Worldwide. Many of them pedestrians, which is another dimension of connectivity. Right particularly in emerging economies. But even in the United States, uh, we're, it's dropping, but it's still on the order of 30,000 fatalities, about 15 to 20% pedestrian. We can do a lot with a connected car in those dimensions. Great, thanks. Martin? So, so I second what Jim says, you know, uh, zero emission, zero fatalities uh, is one of Nissan's slogans. Uh, I think that would be a great, great thing to achieve. But beyond that, um, I want to wake up in the morning and my car knows where I'm going. It actually started planning the night before and told me what time I need to leave. It actually wakes me up and makes coffee. Uh, uh, her name is Sally, by the way. <laughs> um, and I want to have... <laughs> That's a perfect Let, Let's just leave You're it done. at that. <laughs> Sally the car in 10 years, all right. But by the way, Sally is the name of uh, uh, Asimov's book about uh, the autonomous vehicle in, uh, in 19, uh, 2054. He wrote it in 1954. And I um, urge you all, it's only you know, 18 pages long or some a short story. Um, in, in 2054, the cars talk to each other. Their you know, he didn't think about electric cars, but the engines were humming. And, and that humming was uh, running 24 hours, uh, talking to each other, saying like, do you remember that people thought in 2025 where they still were better drivers than we are? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so that's why the name is Sally, by the way. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> okay, so autonomous car driving in 10 years? Really? JJ? This is what you said, right? You, you Before me, the decade, you asked me what <laughs> my what my uh, hope and dream kind of hope and dream. Would okay, be. fair enough, fair enough. Okay, so uh, conversely, biggest fear about connectivity in the next ten years, in the five ten years. Start at the other end, Martin. Yeah, the biggest fear. You know, I have a coin now in my office. Uh, it says CIA on it. <laughs> they came to visit me. 
<laughs> and I thought, what have I done wrong? But it, it wasn't. Um, so, so yeah, um, you know, the, the, it could be a dangerous weapon. It could be. Great. Jim? Well, the dangerous weapon part. You know, we as humans are terrible supervisors. We knew this in World War II when radar operators fell asleep. So the complacency, the fact that we have this, this index of risk, risk homeostasis, some academics would call it, and we don't know how to measure risks, so we think we're really safe in a connected car, but we really aren't, and we become more dangerous. Yeah, good point. JJ? I think it is the, uh, the security and uh, the data privacy part, and uh, you know, I see ourselves actually building cars where you can switch it to off mode, to be completely mm -hmm. offline. And actually, that might be a requirement over the next you know, 10 years uh, to have that. So when people or, or if customers choose not to be, you know, uh, let's say, delivering any information, not to have any data, basically leave the car, uh, not having any profile set, not having any, anything, basically no communication, uh, unless there is some mandating uh, that cars have to talk to each other potentially or so. Uh, but uh, I think. Uh, you know, you will see some developments in this direction just because people are afraid. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge. It would be a, a difficult balance. Rob? Um, well, I, I echo the, you know, the security, the data security aspect of it. And, and um, I, I think that uh, overall, I don't know that I have so much uh, of fear, but just uh, an acknowledgement of the challenges, mm -hmm. you know, to build this, um, this type of a device. Uh, aside from, you know, the, the complexity of, of safety features, it's just... Uh, and extremely, you know, we talked about you, earlier, you asked a question about, you know, is, is, is everything just rosy, you know, on this vision? And, and the, it's certainly going to be extremely difficult mm -hmm. to build um, this car. And I'm not just talking about the processing, but, you know, the, this is an extremely ambitious uh, computer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's not enough to build it, um, to just build it and then charge consumers a tremendous amount of money for it. You know, you have to, uh, I think we have to acknowledge uh, things that, that have, we've done in the computer industry to bring lots of innovation down to a price point where all consumers can benefit from it. It's not gonna help if there's only a few cars and only the premium high-end cars ha are safe. Mm -hmm. you, have, you somehow have to bring this capability down into mainstream. And, and what that requires is um, architecture and and thoughtfulness on, on how you design this, this vehicle. So I think making it mainstream is, is one of the, uh, not a fear, but just one of the you know, challenges that, you know, for, for this industry. Yeah, a social challenge as well as uh, an engineering challenge. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you to these guys. Uh, please. <laughs> I know you all have. Uh, Questions and, and thoughts of your own. Let's, let's start back there. I'm Mike Shepard from Growth Point. I was at a, a Churchill club a few weeks ago at Citrix, and uh, they had Joey Ito and Reed Hoffman, uh, and the two of them were talking about, well, you know, it's going to happen when Sally, Martin Sally, decides that in the inevitable carnage that's happening right in front of them, that in order to save the lives of the other people in the other cars, Sally's going to kill you. <laughs> She's going to make that decision. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I just what, what's going to happen? When, when is this stuff going to be? Uh, I, what I heard is some of the states are actually allowing these self-driving cars to be legal and approved now or imminently. What's the state of the, the government um, legislation around um, licensing these self-driving vehicles? Since you so, so alluded I, to Sally, we'll let Martin thing. start with that. Asimov had a rule for that. You know, rule number one: a robot can never kill, you know, a human. <laughs> so that, that we, anyway. But there is still the decision tree if the choice is uh, somehow, you know, between killing three humans and killing one, it should choose you know, to the, kill the this one. Is right? a, this is an ethical dilemma. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at, at, at the Nissan Research Center, we have a meetup every month, and, and you know, I had um, an ethics professor talk about this dilemma. Um, this is not a new dilemma, you know, this dilemma. Uh, has been recognized in the, the HRI community, human-robot interaction community, um, where there is this ethical dilemma of somebody who builds a robotic system um, 
with decision making and and sure if we can all leave it up to machine learning and all you know to uh, to deep learning and we don't know anymore how the car come up comes up with its rules but there are decisions that one needs to make and it's it, it's an ethical problem it's an ethical engineering problem um, that you cannot just you know s swipe under the carpet um, so these are are tough issues um, and and you know I hate to say to see it that you know you pay more for a car you're safer you know that <laughs> that I don't I don't you know so so these are tough tough yeah. you know, questions continues to be the case uh, next question Oh, good evening. I'm uh, Dr. Donna Schaefer, and I have some students with me this evening. So as a teacher, I have to ask, um, what does the driver's ed class of the future look like? Very nice question. Uh, anyone have a, and, and, and a video, a, let's, video let's game? <laughs> <laughs> let's let's see if, uh, if Jim and Rob can take a stab at that. Well, I imagine it's an online video tutorial. You know, you just... <laughs> And the it's driver, an app. The driver right? Ed yeah. guy is out of a job. <laughs> well, I yeah. well I, I'm going to be, yeah. give away my, my age indirectly, but in the 70s, I took driver's ed, and we had simulators. Mm -hmm. And we called them stimulators. When was this? In the 70s. Oh, okay. We called them, uh, <laughs> say louder again. Carry we we called them stimulators because uh, there was actually, it wasn't, didn't have NVIDIA type graphics. And, and then yeah, the, we were not around. And the force feedback on the throttle wasn't there, so we'd go up our driveways at 80 miles an hour. <laughs> but that's in the past. In the future, you can take and imagine products that, that, that your company is famous for. Yeah. Uh, and a little bit of engineering, you can actually have a very intense, immersive experience. And I'm not a great prognosticator. But learning from the past, I think that, that there, there will be a radical change in, in how we handle you know, things like being asleep with automated cars and, and how you train people. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that uh, um, the art of simulation uh, is one of, the, one of the areas where it, it, NVIDIA spends a fair amount of time, so whether it's flight or, or driving simulators. But uh, you know, Kyle Busch uses a simulator to practice driving. You know, and and it's, it's not just about how something visually appears, but also uh, how do things behave. So, you know, uh, what is the physics of going on? If you hit a bump at a certain speed, then what will the reaction of the car be? So the, the simulation, at least within our world, is, is, is more than just visual fidelity. It's, it's also about how things behave properly. And, and those, uh, those things uh, have come an enormous amount, uh, an enormous way. So... I don't know. I think that that might be one answer. Yeah. Thank I, you for inventing a new line of business for. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually think it is not a easy problem. Um, mm -hmm. So so I've been driving the Q50 with ADAS system for more than half a year. Um, this this car, um, in the right country, not in the United States, but in Europe, could drive for minutes at a time uh, without touching the steering wheel, if if you would allow it. Um, on 280, it can do quite a lot of time uh, keeping lane and, and stopping and you know just driving. It is not something you just step into and, and understand where the limits of that system is. So in the early stages of uh, the way the car manufacturers will bring autonomy to, to the consumer um, will not be as full autonomy. And, and in some ways, we have to learn how to deal with this. And I think you know there will be a question whether this should be part of of, uh, of the, the driver's training, is to learn how to deal with an autonomy that is not 100% uh, full autonomy, and that you have to step in and at what time, and and what is the system not supposed to, you know, what you're not supposed to be doing with the system. Um, recently, this last couple of weeks, there have been some videos on YouTube about usage of these these type of systems that you know. I don't think it's very smart to uh, to do, and and you know people will need to know about that, what the limitations are, and the more autonomy becomes to full autonomy, so the more capable the autonomy becomes, but is not perfect, the more difficult it will be to understand what the limitations of a system are, and and that is a problem that we have to solve, but it's also a problem of the young drivers or the new drivers, and then I'm not even touching about driver fatigue, like what the airlines are. Uh, you know, seeing now with uh, uh, autonomous pilots or automatic pilots in airplanes, where you're not, you don't just have the experience anymore when you need to take over. So I, I, it is a serious issue, I think. 
So next question here. Hi, my name is Gautam Ashok, and I'm from Accenture. A wonderful discussion. Um, as you were all discussing about the connected car, um, I, a thought occurred to me as to what's the current stage, current state of the internet infrastructure, the cellular infrastructure in the United States. And as it were, I, I happened to look at my smartphone. And um, you probably m might have read articles over the years as to how the US is lagging behind when it comes to connectivity. And I'm assuming that if a car has to communicate to the cloud, it would have to be, you know, if you look at the present day, it would probably be through cell phone towers. So I was wondering, you know, um, if that aspect is going to get more focus and what needs to be done to really push uh, the upgrading of the infrastructure. And I just have had a quick question on. You know, as cars become more and more autonomous, do you um, foresee a cultural shift? Because for quite some time, you can say that the car has been, you can say, an expression of the individualism of the people in this country. So as people, I guess, find themselves less and less in charge of driving, you think that will get accepted over time from a cultural point? So there's sort of two parts. One is the state of the uh, cellular network, and the other is the, the individual experience. Right. Uh, Jim, can you take the first one? Well, uh, I, I, sure, why not? Um, thanks. JJ <laughs> was giving a dream where he hoped that we would have autonomous cars in 10 years. But 10 years from now, think about telephony in, in the cell system. You're going to have 5G. So think, don't look at your cell phone now. Imagine yourself looking at better connectivity in 10 years. And maybe verticals are use cases that, that really tend to lend themselves toward connected cars. If you think about DSRC, this, this horse that I rode in on, that's short range communication. So that, oh wow, what does that mean? Is you have to have a hot spot within connectivity range of virtually every road. That, that's not going to happen here, not in 100 years. You may see them at most intersections, but that's only at a hot spot around an intersection. So don't put all your eggs in one basket is the short term. The longer term is, is that um, if there is a consumer demand for us to have connectivity and mobility, there will be an infrastructure, perhaps a private sector infrastructure, that meets that demand. Great. And uh, the individual expression, uh, JJ, I imagine you are eager to take that one on. Is, yeah, it, is it an in, inside the uh, cockpit expression instead of an external one? Or? Yeah, but I think the point was also the acceptance um, mm -hmm. of, of basically the autonomous car. And actually, we have done uh, already studies in our you know, large uh, simulator where we have brought customers in and we have done interviews and, and basically monitored you know, the uh, participants uh, and, and saw basically how high the acceptance level were you know, before they actually heard of the autonomous car and, and, and so on and then um, going through the process of teaching them what it can do, what it cannot do, what the limitations are, then actually being in the simulator driving in through, you know, through different scenarios on the highway and then just you know staying in one lane following a car type of scenario uh, and then also like you know doing maneuvers like passing other cars on the highway and so on and then even you know directly after the let's say the experience of having been in an autonomous car and, and then uh, actually um, later on even weeks after that experience uh, you know, you could see the acceptance level was you know extremely high and it stayed actually at a, at a very high level after the experience. So what I expect to happen is actually that the acceptance level will be very high and that uh, as people get used to it, as people experience it, as people learn to trust uh, the system like they learn to trust uh, cruise control and, and um, you know, Distronic Plus, in our case, adaptive cruise control and so on, I think uh, it will happen and it will be massively adopted and accepted. Great. Uh, next question. Hi, this is Ashu Goyal from Winwire. Hi, JJ. Um, quick question around healthcare. I'm surprised I didn't hear about connectivity onto the healthcare side. So, if you can talk and hear a little bit more about uh, sort of a mobile healthcare unit, your car is a mobile healthcare unit, that would be great. Uh, Martin, that sounds like an astronaut problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, um, actually, I, I worked on, on healthcare for the astronaut in the spacesuit. Um, we had speech dialogue, and you could ask, you know, and it was tied to a plan, and so it could tell what to drink, when to eat, you know, um, 
when to go back because the oxygen was running out. Um, it's a very difficult problem for the car manufacturers, um, the healthcare issue, um, because of the business model, right? I mean, there has to be a way uh, to make money of a service that you provide in the car. And um, so it has to be, it, it, it is about, first of all, a cost issue about what sensors do you bring in the car, right? And, and then if you really talk about healthcare, these sensors, do they need to be FDA approved? Um, you know, then you're not talking about cheap sensors. So, so, so this is not a, a, a simple answer to, to sure, you know, we can, uh, and, and then the other question, well, okay, you can bring Fitbit into your car and can you then connect Fitbit you know, and then, you know, what is then the value of that? And, you know, it's really, is the car manufacturer going to, you know, have to create that and support that? Is that, so these are, uh, it's more a business problem than it is a technology problem. And this, by the way, I think we haven't discussed yet, but the issue of, you know, what is the business model to provide services to the customer in the car that you can make money off is still an unsolved problem. And I think healthcare is one of those. Um, from a safety point of view, um, you know, if you're in an accident and the car can tell the, the EMT, um, you know, what, that you're still alive, um, you know, the, what happened, uh, you know, where, where are you broken, uh, that, that would be nice. Um, but are you willing to pay for it? Um, that's the question. So if I can get the Flintstone car that will give me my workout and measure the calories. That's, in my that would maybe, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, great. Uh, I'll, I'll make that no, no, no. There you go, take that, Flintstone. take that home with you. My innovation of the day. Uh, next question, please. Where are we? There Hi. We are. Thank you so much for the discussion. I have a question. I went to a hackathon by launch, and there was a middleware platform called Carvoyant, which basically is just connects a chip inside the car system and anyone can hack, I mean, not the internal framework and do some crazy stuff, but just using the data of the car to build something. And I thought, I mean, to answer the personalization problem that can really solve it to a certain degree, where instead of dealing with the applications and platforms that are currently available in the car, people can just build their own plugins and applications that best, best fits the requirement. So I was wondering, Will the car have any form, like will the, will the car manufacturing firms or industries have any form of, for example, like instead of having interior, exterior, and accessories you can select from, also like, for example, what are the customized plugins that would you, you would like to have? Or if there's a way where, for example, a hacker like myself can just connect something that says if I'm close to a gas station, and hopefully when the gas station can accept bitcoins or any other form of things virtually, I can just have my car stand next to them. The, Ga like the gas pump is already paid for without me doing anything. Yeah, Nissan will have the, the autonomous SDK and, and you can change the autonomous. <laughs> <laughs> right, I, think, I think the answer is uh, at least on, on our side, uh, multifold. So there are platforms out there, you know, like Android Auto or uh, Apple CarPlay, which I think will enable, you know, third party developers in one way or another to right application for, for the automotive uh, use case. And you will also see, and uh, we have also worked with, and we have our own kind of you know, SDK type uh, solution uh, to work with uh, you know, maybe not each individual and individual customer around the world, but with you know, smaller companies, larger companies, and so on to uh, bring solutions you know, through the cloud, through the smartphone, and so on to the car. So um, it's... Uh, I think this is probably very, let's say, kind of OEM specific, and uh, there will likely not be like one SDK for all OEMs besides, let's say, kind of the big players uh, like Apple or Google. Great. Next question. Thank you. Hi, Brian Gonch with Deloitte. We've talked about a lot of connectivity tonight, but one thing we didn't talk about is connections to the insurance industry. To the what? Uh, insurance, insurance industry. So you have a lot of costs you described and some legal liability and some other things with autonomous and connected cars, but there could be a ton of savings and the insurance companies could reap some of those savings and pass it along, maybe, <laughs> to consumers. <coughs> so could you talk a little bit about how a black box to insurance or some other form of connection to insurance could help pay for some of the, all this? So solutions are already available. I mean, kind of pay-as-you-drive packages and so on. There are different insurance companies which are 
already offering that partially through their own kind of dongle, which you plug into your OBD port, which gets all the information. So uh, it's also available, let's say, through kind of built-in connected uh, modules. And uh, it's, uh, I, think, I think even the insurance companies, let's say, I would, I would say they are still you know, playing with this topic and you know, figuring out, is it good for them or does it hurt their business models and so on. So um, there is some adoption, but uh, I think both, both sides are basically still trying it out in pilots and, and seeing uh, whether it, it makes sense or not. Because I think customers are also somewhat, uh, let's say, uh, cautious in terms of what data uh, and and uh, so on is is you know available about them uh, and is it really helping them or, or is it hurting them in the longer term? Jim, I know you're not a well, big no. prog prognosticator, well, but I suspect you <laughs> have some thoughts about and what's I, and happening. And I don't work there. for a car company. And after I say this, I never will. <laughs> um, but um, something that's very analogous to that is the uh, road user fee idea. So we pay a gas tax. Well, that you know our, we've probably seen that the highway trust fund almost went bankrupt. This is a uh, unsustainable, well, if we pay by time of day or by demand or by route, uh, the connected car can enable that. And that's very similar in technology to user-based insurance, uh, where you would then, then geofence or geozone someone's travel and, and temporally segment where someone travels. And that could be just as powerful an incentive, at least from the social good perspective. You may think it's bad to pay this usage tax, but from a social perspective as, as insurance, as, as a way to, to spur connectivity, albeit from a pretty unpopular way by some of your customers. But as I said, I, I, I don't work for Mercedes or anything. <laughs> Great, thank you. Next uh, question. Yes, uh, Robert Mullins, I'm a tech reporter here in Silicon Valley. Um, right now, some of the car technology, the connected car technology, um, is seen by some people as a contributor to distracted driving. Um, and I'm wondering how you develop your connected car technology going forward to where it's not a source of distracted driving, but a truly autonomous car, as you've talked about this evening. Also, a quick follow-up question. Will we still be able to have car chases in the movies? <laughs> We used to have so many movies that were about somebody trying to get to a phone, right? Or a phone wire that was kind of like, it don't make any sense to the kids that are born in 2000. We have car chasers and you'll never catch each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but to, to, your first, first, yeah, right? to your first uh, question, it's a very valid question. I think it's kind of twofold. Until we have you know, fully autonomous cars, you know, level four automation uh, yeah. in between you know, now and that time, uh, you will see a lot of focus actually on, on uh, minimizing driver's distraction. And if you look at, you know, even like a head-up display versus a display mounted in your dashboard, I mean, that already helps immensely, you know, with using that for all kinds of especially driving-related, uh, you know, kind of uh, information and maybe even, uh, you know, action uh, and so on. You don't have to take your eyes uh, off the road. And uh, it's much safer than actually having to look down uh, away from, from the road level. And another big focus area is voice and multimodal interaction uh, you know, with these computers, with the car, with the cloud, with basically all of your content and uh, making that more reliable, making it not a frustrating experience as it often is today. Um, that is actually huge. And uh, there are huge investments in you know, doing off-board and hybrid uh, voice recognition and so on, having you know, all these servers uh, in the cloud basically supporting that. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, there are a lot of, let's say, good solutions and, and good, uh, let's say, investments in this area to minimize distraction until we get to the point where the car drives safely from A to B, where then that's not a topic anymore. And actually, uh, these side tasks, as we call them, are fully OK to basically have uh, you doing a video conference uh, call or uh, <laughs> uh, you know, having your car being a movie theater. Great. Next question. Hi, my name is Akil Hitter. I'm with Windwire. Um, last year, there were more than 10,000 drunk driving deaths in the US. Uh, that means f every 48 minutes, a person is dying. How about? leveraging autonomy and connected to enforce if you're drunk you're not driving 
I mean, can, is, is that a technology that can be built as a regulation? Or is there something that the car manufacturers can enforce so that doesn't happen? Secondly, um, what about people who are in, and I'm using this as an analogy, Joe Blow from Texas, he says, it's against my independence you collecting all this data and data privacy. How do you de measure and see the two evolving? Am I the designated the, regulation? You're the regulation <laughs> guy. <laughs> so, you know, you can do um, uh, ignition alcohol interlock, or you can do ignition now, switches. Right? But see, I'm not a politician, I just vote for them. But as I understand that the politicians don't want that to happen. But to your point, um, about a, alcohol is a contributor, co contributor, about a third of fatalities on the US roads. Speeding and seatbelt usage are the other co contributors. So if you can do something with, uh, with regulation to address all those, that's great. I'm going to say that the technology is already there. It's not necessarily a connected car technology. It just requires political will. Um, so this is a, a discussion that transcends this type of technology, although I can imagine some use cases where the connectivity and enforcement, another bad set of words, uh, could actually be beneficial society, to society. But again, I'm not going to posture a way to vote, and I don't think that if you voted for someone over in that platform, he or she would get elected. Yeah, but, but also, if we get to level four, right, then you can sit right. in the back seat and get pour right. yourself a cocktail, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we'll see when we get there. We'll see when we get there, yeah, <laughs> if we get there. Right? Yeah, but I also wanted to add, I mean, some small steps in this direction, what we uh, can do and, and have done, like, all Mercedes models, you know, from the A-Class in Europe, CLA here in the U.S., all the way to an S-Class, S-Class Coupe, uh, basically have um, serious equipment, the attention assist, which monitors basically your uh, driving behavior and, and uh, uh, your interaction with the steering wheel, and we have kind of 17 different, you know, sensing, uh, let's say, um, algorithms uh, and so on working and uh, they bring you a little coffee cup and tell you that you should take a break now uh, as soon as the car realizes that you are about to fall asleep uh, and uh, I think that's already a, a good step and I think every car uh, on the road should have this and of course next steps can follow sensor technology it's all available. Yeah. You did mention earlier the possibility of uh a switch or a button that you could turn off your connectivity, or whether that would be required or just an option. Uh, did anyone else have anything they wanted to add to that in response to the question, or did you have more you wanted to elaborate? I, I, what I would say is data privacy is very important, and I think we're taking that very seriously and thinking differently. Uh, you know, what you know from smartphones today, at least from some, um, that it's more on you know, kind of an opt-out model where all these services and, and, and so on and uh, getting data you know, out of the devices. If you think about all the sensors and cameras and everything you have on your smartphone, um, you know, I, I think uh, the topic already starts there about you know, are customers really willing to share all this data and so on. And uh, I think switching it from an opt-out to an opt-in model where everything is turned off and actually customers have to actively you know, opt in and accept, let's say, uh, um, certain data to leave the car or leave your device. Uh, um, I think it's already a, a big help and it will help actually address and, and uh, make people more aware of actually uh, which data is even uh, you know, shared or is communicated and, and uh, uh, what is the benefit for the customer if they opt in, what is the level of service they get back and, and so on. So I think there will be a lot of good, let's say, discussions and I think the, the way we are about to, to actually work on this and, and implement it uh, with the opt-in model and being very transparent and having the ability to switch everything off, I think it's, it's very important and will help actually building trust, building trust I think even in specific brands. If you handle it well, I think customers will be more willing to, to trust certain brands and maybe even pick a certain car uh, model or, or make. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, Jim, did you have anything to add as the non-regulator? Is the <laughs> anything on, on that? No, I, I, actually, I, I, I don't own data. Uh, I give it up freely to companies like Mercedes. <laughs> but Thank no, I, I don't make a car. I only okay. drive them. All right. Uh, so we still have some time for a few more questions. The next 
Um, uh, I'm Gigi Segal from TCS, and Robert over, over there, who I don't know, yeah. sort of stole my thunder. So you may have answered some of the part of the question I'm about to ask. But just practically speaking, two questions. One is logistics. As presuming these things start rolling out, there isn't going to be a time where everybody is 100% on connected cars or 100% on uh, autonomous cars. You're going to probably have a mixed model. 10 years from now, I'm probably still driving my Honda CRV, and mm -hmm. my daughter, who's a teenager now, is probably happily texting away or whatever the equivalent is then. Uh, in a completely autonomous car, and then there's the guy from Texas maybe in his connected car, but he's still driving it to some degree. So what do the roadways look like? What does the crowd control, the traffic control looks like? Um, coexisting, sharing the road in this kind of model. And then a follow-up question, it, just speculating that if this is based on some kind of demographic slash geographic zoning or whatever, and some kind of control in that sense, what is the tipping point for you know the early adopters versus the late adopters versus the people in the middle? Good questions. Anyone able to <laughs> jump up to that? I think sounds like I'm in an Institute of Transportation Engineers meeting. <laughs> but basically, the people who are in charge of road operations are exact asking the exact questions as you. And I, for one, don't have the answer, and the community largely doesn't have the answer. Um, just a, a thing about this DSRC connectivity, and your point comes to heart. Say that 20% of all cars have DSRC transceivers on them. All things being equal, the probability of you encountering another one is about 4%. So it's going to take a long time for this network of car-to-car -car connectivity. Car-to-cloud is a completely different story, and that is perhaps the happier and shorter story. So I would also add, your question is the struggle for the car manufacturers to decide what to bring to market when and how to bring it to market and this is not an easy it, it's not an easy answer you know and um, it will by going slow I mean if you look at um, the way for instance uh, Nissan and Infiniti uh, communicate about the technology in the car um, they, they don't go out and, and, and advertise that it is a drive by, steer by wire car in the Q50. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it is, you know, but, but these cars are driving on the road today. You know, um, I can tell you it drives very nicely. It drives a lot better than any other steering wheel I've ever felt because, there, you know, even in the United States on their highways, it can still hold your steer, you know, cup of coffee in your hand because it doesn't go like this. Um, and, and so technology will come more and more will be accepted. Um, but we will have to bring it to market with the knowledge that you will be driving your CRV for the next 10 years. And, you know, that, that, and, and it will have to live together with all these cars. So, so it is a, it's a balancing act of, of um, you know, how much to bring to market when and when will people accept it. And it is the, the customer that will either accept it or not. Um, you know, I think that is, the, that is the big question that everybody is wondering. I think Mercedes is wondering that. That's, <laughs> we are wondering that. And, you know. yeah. I, I think um, uh, last week we had a, a chance to listen to uh, uh, one of the guys uh, in the Department of Transportation for Michigan. And he, he was actually describing that uh, 100 years ago, we've already gone through this kind of a transformation. You know, everybody rode horses. And, and when you rode a horse on the road, you know, it was all horses. And then when, when a car, an iron horse came, you know, and it was a two-lane road, then the, the cars went on the inside lane and the horses were moved out, you know, to the outer lane. And then after a period of time when there were enough cars, then the horses weren't allowed to go on the freeway, you know, and they had to go on a side road. So, uh, you know, over a, over a period of time, we're certainly going to have a mixed fleet. You know, with, with I think the average life, uh, you know, car life, uh, you know, at 11 years, you know, certainly within, within 10 to 15 years, there's not going to be, you know, a fully autonomous, you know, fleet of cars out there. So I could have, you know, I think the, the way that this gentleman imagined it, you, depending on, you know, the evolution of the cars and as the mix increases, you can imagine your, the inside lane of your freeway is an autonomous lane and you can move at a, 
mm. you know, faster speed, and then the next lane over is semi-autonomous, or, you know, you, you, there's probably something like that that you can see, you know, evolving, uh, similar to what happened 100 years ago. Good point. Thanks for remembering that. Uh, next question. Yeah, hi. Charlie Vogelheim from Motor Trend. So first of all, comment to Mercedes when you're monitoring all these people. If you could just let them get out of the left lane, if they're not passing somebody, that'd be awesome. We would be very thankful for that. So just take them over right away. Um, a lot of things you were talking about connectivity and just want to bring it down to maybe a little bit unsexy in the way that the battleground of who owns the IP, who owns the instrument panel, is it the consumer, is it the OEM, is it the third party that's developing it? And then also the next level of battleground is the connectivity. We're, we're, why is it the car that needs to connect? We've all got smartphones. Why isn't that just making all the connection? And why don't all the smartphone users connect with each other and we have GPSs and we can see closure rates and now all of a sudden you're involving pedestrian and cyclists into the whole mix and something like that. How real is that kind of statement though? Thanks, that's Charlie. You've stunned them. That's yeah. <laughs> that's what, I mean. Well, I guess, you know, I'll take a, I'll take, I'll open it up or, or just start out. Uh, certainly when you, when you move to, uh, when you move from physical gauges to a, a digital cluster environment, you're, uh, you, you obviously have a lot more options now. Uh, I'm, I think one of the, the first objectives of, of a digital cluster or digital dashboard is um, safety. You know, you want to improve the way that information is presented to you so that you, you can uh, make better decisions and drive more safely. But at the same time, you know, there's no doubt in the, you know, we have an SDK for designing a cluster and, and as part of that, you can customize it. You, know, you, can, you can choose, you know, um, you know, the car maker can match the style of the interior of your car, which consumers pay a lot for, you know, and match it to the physical design and the graphic design of what's inside your cluster. And then, theoretically, you could have some choices. So, so certainly, all of these things are now, you know, possible, and, 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 and this, this opens up this new world of, of uh, both some amount of control that I'm sure the car makers want to have, because you don't want to turn over all control. You know, hey, I don't need a speedometer, you know, and just remove it from your panel. So, uh, you know, I think uh, there's some amount of control and then some amount of customization, which people expect when they have a consumer device or a computer, right? Um, as far as the other stuff, I mean, I'll, I'll let somebody else <laughs> yeah. comment. But I, on the connectivity side, I mean, we have actually um, uh, built in different models, uh, actually, depending on the market. Like since 1999, you know, our cars in the United States are connected and uh, we made this a standard equipment, you know, a few years later uh, that basically every single car has a connectivity module, now 3G. Uh, in Europe, for example, we um, try or we started with a model where the customer would bring in the connectivity. So we use actually the customer's uh, smartphone uh, connectivity with tethering and so on. Uh, but we are also moving in Europe now to a model where each vehicle, you know, also has at least a 2.5G connectivity also, you know, basically working on already on the LTE uh, generation and so on for that. So just to ensure, you know, for certain basic services, we don't want to rely on the customer having a tethering contract or, or having the, you know, the right technology in the car and so on and so on. So I think uh, at least in the premium segment, you will see that, you know, the, connect the car will bring in its own connectivity for many different, you know, services and, and both, you know, bringing kind of the internet in the car and also the car being part of the internet of, of everything uh, because it makes a lot of sense, I think, on the, let's say, maybe more mass market brands and vehicles, uh, they probably start at the other end uh, and then uh, there's a mix in between. So you're, you're talking, in a sense, about the democratization of connectivity to anyone who has this ubiquitous smartphone. And usually when I channel standards in a big audience, I'm a wet blanket. But in fact, the ETSI, which I said earlier, was European Telecommunication Standards Institute, SAE, which if you're more trying to know what that is. Um, there is a joint work on V2P applications layer that is media independent message sets to, to try to, at least in the standardization realm, is to imagine this world, this picture that you're painting. How it gets instantiated is, is perhaps everyone else's job here, but at least the standards and the thought that you have, which is very meritorious, is being worked on. Lots of devil in the details, and you know, I invite you to go to standards meetings with me and multitask, please, because they're really slow, but the point is, is that things are <laughs> happening. 
I also think it's happening today, right? I mean, uh, you're not going to stop it. You know, bringing your own phone in the car and having connectivity and apps will show up that will allow you to connect to other folks, you know, on the road. They're already there, like Waze. And so, you know, I, I don't, like every other technology that is out there, it's not an either or kind of proposition. The question is, where do we, we draw lines of where we let the phone do certain things and let the car do other things? Um, you know, in, in, I think it's, at least from what I understand right now, you know, it, it's a product planning kind of decision. Um, and then you have the issue right now uh, that the car is 18, you know, goes on, I think it's even more than 11 years, it's, it's 18 more, years. 11 is the average age of, the yeah. car, of a car on the road. So you can expect most cars to last 20 years or so. I think 20% of the vehicles on the road are more than 16 years old at this point. So yeah, we're talking about a long adoption yeah. period. Um, so, so I think it's a product planning kind of question and then a business model question more than what the capabilities are. I mean, of course we can, we can do everything. The customer will demand, you know, I think both. Yeah. Great, uh, we'll have just two more questions, one over here. Hi, I'm from Sama Technologies Insurance Practice, and there was already a question regarding insurance. Um, so all this big data analytics uh, of the telematics data is very interesting to us. Uh, but what really happens uh, once you know autonomous cars are there? Like, what happens to insurance at that time? I mean, they're a very good, big part of our revenue. So. <laughs> <laughs> When there are no crashes. Guess, guess who, will be, who will be crying about that? <laughs> <laughs> Not the consumer. <laughs> Any, anyone have anything more to, to add? I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, if you can if make it crash free car. If I can help that I have to pay less for insurance, you know, I'll, be, I'll be on it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll get Nobel Prizes. Uh, next question, <laughs> last question. Oh. All right. Uh, thanks for the great discussion. Uh, my name is Yo from Drive Mode, which is an um, Android-based UX app for, for drivers for in the connected uh, car field. Uh, we're in, still in stealth, so nobody except for a few people know about us. But uh, um, So I, w I have a que question to JJ and Martin, uh, which is, so when, when I saw the, the brochure, it says, uh, who can win, right? Um, in th these kind of events, Apple or Google never show up. And they don't say anything to us, right? Mm -hmm. But you guys are working with them. Are, are is that because they are winning? Or, you know, because they are basically saying that they're going to do all of those things that we are talking about. And then they're like, we don't need you, right? And then, but you guys are working with them. So I was a, I'm just wondering, what's your views on, on those guys who are basically saying that we're going to dominate the community? Connected car industry, and then you know you guys give us data, and then we'll take care of it, right? So um, I just wonder why you guys are working with them, Apple and Google, Apple and Google, those guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those guys. Apple and Google, JJ. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll let JJ start first. <laughs> <laughs> to be very clear, actually, uh, I think. Apple and Google, on the one hand, they are great partners. Um, they have helped us a great deal, actually, to make the connected car reality. I think about all the Google services. You know, you have in a Mercedes from uh, Google Local Search, Google Places, uh, Google Street View, Panoramio, Google Maps, uh, very intelligent search without a complete, uh, and so on and so on. It's great, and we have a relationship with Google, and uh, we have a strategic partnership, and. Uh, of course, you know, if you look at the next level with Android Auto or, or you know, Apple CarPlay, now with an Apple experience or a Google experience in you know, our vehicles, in everyone's vehicles, uh, the, the game kind of changes. Uh, but uh, you know, for us, uh, clearly, it actually motivates us to make our Mercedes-Benz experience the best and then let the customer choose. I think at the end of the day, the market, the customers, you know, will vote for and will choose, you know, the experience which is the best. And uh, if you think about, you know, the opportunities we have with, you know, an immersive experience, I talked about the two 12.3-inch displays, a head-up display, and, you know, kind of, let's say, 
imagining the map kind of being at the forefront and being a central point and, and uh, having you know, contextual-based uh, information and uh, a very smart, let's say, uh, machine learning algorithm with predictions and uh, then, you know, for example, access to the uh, head-up display, um, which only we have uh, for our own Mercedes-Benz uh, uh, experience uh, and so on. I think it will actually be a very open uh, playing field and uh, it's uh, actually good to have competition in the space and I think what we can learn certainly from Apple is uh, to build uh, simple solutions and making the UI, making the UX being very simple, very intuitive, uh, uh, because certainly we have built systems, you know, which are quite complex and not so easy to use. And I'm sure many of you driving a Mercedes today wish, you know, we would do a better job and have just having a very uh, easy interface. And uh, in that regards, I think actually I think it helps at the end to have solutions which are, you know, on the one hand easy to use uh, and so on, and also. Uh, open for you know uh, companies like yours or, or other partners to to actually build experiences and build innovation on top of these platforms. Martin, what he said? No. <laughs> 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 you, you know, um, gosh, I, I think it's a really it's a hot potato. You know, it's kind of like I, I don't I don't even know what to do with with the question. Um, because as a as a consumer of uh, Apple and Google products, you know, and I'm stepping in my car. So, so I want this experience to be seamless, right? Um, you know, my Sally uh, idea is not so far-fetched. If I'm in the home and I'm working on something and I get in the car, I don't want to have to suddenly change. You know, I want to be seamless. Um, so, you know, so Google and Apple right now are the companies that are providing that. I'm not sure if they're going to be there doing that forever or the only ones are going to do that. Um, and we will have to change. If, if, if the industry, the car industry has been around for a lot longer, and so we will have to make sure that, that yes, all this will be possible, and then you also want to build your own product brand identity um, and capture uh, the customer for a longer period of time uh, than just one one car purchase, and these are questions that become business questions. They're not technology questions, and these will be answered over time. Um, uh, as JJ said, I mean, you know, we, we it, it in one in one side. What what I say about Google from the autonomous side? Well, I, I actually say I start by saying without DARPA, we wouldn't be sitting here, right? Uh, because of the grand challenge. And then without uh, uh, Stanford winning and CMU winning, we, Google wouldn't be, be having this because they just bought, you know, they just took that technology and continued with it. But that actually drove the industry to, to get, you know, off you know what and start working <laughs> on it. And I think, we, you know, this, this will be a good, uh, a good interaction. Um, the one interesting thing about privacy uh, and, and about uh, data and, and, you know, it's like, what about Google? I mean, everybody's like, oh, what are you going to do with your car? And everybody, you know, it's like, Google already knows where you are every moment of the day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would be less worried about the car companies than I'm worried about Google. Um, you know, so, so this to me is, is, uh, is an interesting, you know, uh, play. Thanks, Joe. Karen? I'd like to thank our speakers for sharing their views. We appreciate you sharing your views so candidly. Thank you. And Jamie, you were a marvelous moderator. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Very fun. <laughs> would like to thank Bloomberg again. And by the way, there are copies of the brand new Bloomberg Business Week out as you leave. And on page 20, there is an article about the Tesla Toyota partnership that you will find of interest. I would like to Thank NVIDIA and Tracy of Airfoil. And um, also, hopefully tomorrow, but might be the next day, just depending, we should have our video, this video up on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Churchill Club. So check it out and let people know about it. And you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. See you next time. Thank you.